in five, four, three. Hey everyone, Graham from Loudwire here, and today my guest is the one and only legendary Eric Andre. How are you doing today, man? I got filthy fingernails. Why don't you pick up that bass and show us what you're made of? Boom. Dude, I I know you're all about the bass. I would never Boom. try to throw my chops in front of you, Mr. Berkeley College of Music. Nah, my chops are 19 years rusty, man. I'm sure you can lay a thick bass line down. Well, I'll do it another time. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> no time like the present, my man. Pick it up. Boom, 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 boom. Bow, bow. I can't do that Seinfeld shit. Anyway, <laughs> Bad Trip is the movie, and it is out March 26. Uh, make sure you see that on Netflix. It's finally out after a long, long wait. And Eric, what I do is a thing called Wikipedia Fact or Fiction. I went on your Wikipedia pages, looked at some stuff, and you're going to tell me whether it's real or whether it's bullshit, okay? Sounds good. All right. So because we check everybody's basic information, uh, it says Eric... Andre, absolutely no middle name, born in Boca Raton, Florida. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I have a middle. My middle name is Samuel. Samuel. Uh, my uh, my mom's uncle Samuel died right before I was born. And it's a Jewish thing. You like, we're a very morbid tribe. I don't know. You name your, you give your kid the middle name of the uncle or aunt that just died, something like that. My sister's middle name is Pearl, but it was supposed to be like Nadej, but then Aunt Pearl died, so she got Pearl. I know what you mean. I'm a fellow uh, Ashkenaz. It says on Wikipedia that you originally formed your music project Blarf at Berkeley, and the band was extremely short-lived because the drummer got married at 18 to an extremely pro-life woman and because you made a song called I Love Abortions. Yeah. Does it say that on Wikipedia? It says that. God, I must have said that during an interview. Poor guy. I don't want to, like... Uh... <laughs> He was a nice guy. They were like, uh, they were that couple that was married at 18 and they were from like a podunk, like Possum Ridge, Arkansas kind of thing. But I put, so, so this is what happened. I put that song, I Love Abortion on my, um, on my CD of the demo of the music I wanted to play on purpose. Cause I was like, I'm going to make offensive lyrics. So only join the band if you're you're okay with doing like frank zappa-esque edgy you know trey parker matt stone edgy lyrical content then he signed up for the band and then he gave me shit about the song i was like dude i showed you that song like so that you wouldn't join the band because and he was like well i didn't have a problem with him but my my child bride wife had a problem with it i mean they were both the same age it sounds i'm not i'm not they call him a pederast and i feel bad because he was like and his wife was lovely too but that's so interesting that that's on there i must have said that in an interview and forgot but uh you know what the, the song wasn't about being pro-life or pro-choice the song was anti-natal i i, I might be mispronouncing that there's a movement of people that want the human population to be zero and they want the 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 human race to end so that we give the earth back to the plants and the animals. It's more of, um, it's almost like environmentalist in nature, but it's also existential. Like humans are the disease of the earth. And that, that was actually the lyrical content of the song. It, it like had like a provocative title uh, under the guise of being pro-choice, but it was actually, um, uh, anti-human. <laughs> I can get on board with that one. It says on Wikipedia that uh, season one of the Eric Andre show was, of course, filmed in an abandoned bodega in Brooklyn, and at least 20 desks were broken while filming that first season. Well, that's like mashing up information. So okay. that was just um, uh, a sizzle reel that we filmed on my own, like out of my money out of my pocket for very, very, very next to nothing. Um, then once Adult Swim watched that and gave us an offer for a pilot and then the pilot got picked up and then we got 10 episodes ordered for season one. Then I broke about like 20 desks and I, I do break about 20 desks per season. Beautiful. All right. A little bit of misinformation there. Yeah, it was a little bit of a mashup, but that's good. I, I like the premise of this segment because Wikipedia is so... Uh, can be so hit or miss with uh, accuracy. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. 
so it says that in that first season, after filming some Man on the Street segments, you ran out of money and couldn't afford an editor. And knowing that it would be too difficult to explain how to edit the footage properly, you just took on the task yourself and spent one year learning Final Cut. Yeah, that was for the sizzle reel. So I had like a bunch of hard drives filled with material. And I was like, I can't give this to an editor. I can't afford an editor. I can't afford, I could barely afford to film this thing. So I bought Final Cut for Dummies and it took me like a year. I would do like, <laughs> edit like one segment per month, <laughs> very slowly and painfully. I will shout out DJ Doug Pound, Doug Lussenhop for coming over to my house a couple times while I was doing that and just giving me some little bits of uh, information, like tips. Uh, this is an important one. Uh, it says in Wikipedia that you had some production difficulties while planning a scene where you shit so hard that your organs fell out of your anus. Right. So I know that that's also like half information. Every network has a, S, it's called SMP, Standards and Practices Department, right. that kind of like says what you're allowed to say and show and what you're not allowed to say and show on their network like showing nudity or saying curse words or showing how to like cook crystal meth or something. You know what I mean? It's like stuff like that. They came back with a note that was so nuanced and peculiar. We always quote it. It was Eric is only allowed to defecate his organs if it looks accidental. <laughs> so we showed me like, I don't think we used it in the footage. We showed like, there's a shot of me like straining, like I'm trying to shit. And then like another asset of like a PA dropping like meat and like fake organs from like behind me, but we like edited them out. And then I turned to camera and went, whoops, I did that by accident. <laughs> but it didn't look, I don't think we, I, I don't remember if we filmed it and didn't edit it or we like rehearsed it and it didn't even fil bother filming it. But that, yes, that was our one of our favorite um, SMP notes we ever got. It says on season two, yeah. because of the difficulties with gaining consent under California's regulations, some of the impromptu and hidden camera sketches had to be re-recorded in New York City. No, that's no, that's half information. So some states are single consent states, meaning only one party needs to be aware that they're being filmed and recorded. Thanks, buddy. And. Uh, there's dual consent states like California where both parties need to be aware that they're, it's like a wiretapping law actually. So hitting camera is easier to film in New York because it's a single consent state. There's certain states like North Carolina, Ohio, there's certain states where hitting camera pranks are easier to produce because of that law. And we just like filming in New York better anyway, because New Yorkers are more vibrant and uh, have better reactions. So nothing you had to re-record though that you did in LA? No, I mean, we're always like shooting pickups or a prank goes wrong, like in a, not in like a, oh man, that went off the rails, like more like it, it, it was a dud, it didn't work. So we'd have to like refilm it, re retool it so that we would fix the issues and pick it back up. So maybe there were some pranks that we shot in California that kind of flopped, didn't go, like weren't, weren't funny and like didn't really work. I don't know. We're always kind of in the process of like shooting pickups and redoing stuff. So to me, it's like kind of part of the process just because hitting sure camera. So, so much is out of your control with hitting camera stuff. It says on Wikipedia that uh, the cameo from the metal band Exhumed, uh, it says that the show originally wanted Pig Destroyer to perform, but they were unavailable. No, that's not true. I think we just reached out to like a handful of metal bands and um with with metal cachet and and yeah. exhum responded first i remember reaching out to agoraphobic nosebleed um but Crazy. they were on the east coast and we are uh we have a very modest budget for the show so anytime we have to fly somebody out we go oh shit is there anybody local so it might have just been like exhumed was local and and pig destroyer was not because that's what happened with Agoraphobic Nosebleed. We wanted them on as well. But Agoraphobic Nosebleed doesn't have a drummer. Like, it's all drum machine on the albums. That's true. So they, they haven't played that many live shows. No, I think it's like a handful. But they're... they're yeah, like, which is like kind of cool in a, in a unique way. I kind of like that about them. It gives them some, like, mystique. I love them. They're one of Oh, my they're great. Friends. They're so cool. They're so unique and... Uh, they have a special place in my heart. So it says on Wikipedia... 
that the famous uh, kick to Flavor Flav's face did not actually happen. He claims that he was not kicked in the face. Dude, Hannibal kicked him in the motherfucking face. Knocked his ass out, and he'd do it again. All right, that's all I need to hear. <laughs> <laughs> it says on Wikipedia that you actually spent time in the hospital having stitches in your hand due to filming a segment where you were supposed to, it says, hail a cab through a car window. <laughs> no. I don't know what that I, I, I put my hand through a glass window. You can see the bit. We aired oh. it. It's the uh, auto mechanic bit where I, I, I roll my shitty sedan up to a auto mechanic and I go, excuse me, how much is it to fix this? I rip off the windshield wiper. I go, how much is it to fix this? And I put, <laughs> right. I was supposed, I had a hammer in a bag and I try to bash it through the window, but my hand also went through the window and sliced me up. But then I committed to the bit and I destroyed the whole car and I started drinking gasoline. And then, um, yeah, then I had to go to the hospital. That must be fun getting stitches in your hand. Ah, oh, it sucks because you're so I'm so drained, like energy wise during the show. You got to shoot so much, and the days are super long, and you're doing pranks, and your adrenaline is spiking and crashing all throughout the day. And then when you injure yourself, you're just like so exhausted. And I went back out after I got stitches and I had to film more later that day oh. just to like make our day. So it was like miserable. Yeah, you can see in some of the pranks that I have these two big like swabs on my. Um, fingers like Robo Robocop fingers. But, oh God. Yeah. All right. But it is true. I wasn't hailing a cab or anything like that. That's a little bit of uh remix. That would be the big thing. That yeah, yeah that's that's information remix. This is a good uh, lesson. This is actually like what, what I like about your segment is that subtextually it's a lesson on misinformation. And and it it speaks to uh why society's unraveling because there's no journalistic integrity anymore there's just this like rorschach test of misinformation and cognitive dissonance and confirmation bias and this like massive game of hyper partisan telephone that is um like kind of the new standard of uh media and as as replaced journalism so it's it's kind of like we're in this sad augmented reality that we don't we're, we're we're like less and less connected to the truth so i i appreciate you and i appreciate this segment oh that just touched my heart eric Andre. Thank you <laughs> i'm so being much. sincere that's probably the only sincere moment you'll get out of me so relish in it oh okay i'll do that and i'll replay it again and again <laughs> wear, it, wear it like a snuggie i will and last one for you it says on wikipedia that for bad trip again march 26 on netflix uh, before its release, you screened it personally for Sasha Baron Cohen. Yes. That's true. Oh, my God. So you you got to tell me, when you're doing that, is it like you're presenting your artwork to the king? Is it? <laughs> totally. I mean, he's the master. And uh, I was so fortunate to be surrounded by the Mount Rushmore of prank. Jeff Tremain mentoring us the entire time. Uh, as being like the head honcho producer and and then Sasha inviting us into his house and screening it for him on his computer, like in his office, in his house, and him just giving us feedback. And he watched a very, very rough, rough, rough early cut of the movie that was kind of in shambles. So he was, thank God, um, understanding and patient. And we got Chris Rock in, a, in the movie in a scene that got cut because the prank didn't work. And not not because of Chris, because the prank just, just fell apart. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna try to release the Chris Rock prank. It just like failed because like uh, Chris Rock is very famous and like the first person <laughs> the first person recognized him and the other guys we couldn't get in the car. We were trying to do this like hitchhiker prank where Chris plays a cop and pulls us over and we we're trying to get we we're trying to lure people in the pink car and they were like, no, I'm not getting in your fucking car. So it was just like a mess to begin with. And the one person we got in the car recognized Chris right away. So, uh, but yes, to answer your question, we showed Sasha the movie and he was very, very helpful and he's been very helpful. Um, to this day, like he's he's a sweetheart. He's a mensch. So shout out to Sasha, Jeff, and Chris Rock for being my comedy forefathers. Absolutely. Uh, and before we go, I just gotta tell you one thing that I think you might appreciate. So a little while ago, I was on the train in New York City 
uh, I may have been high on ice cream. And suddenly somebody uh, comes through the train and they're completely covered in black, like loose black cloth. You can't see a bit of skin on this person. Uh -oh. And they have a black witch's hat on and they're walking on uh, like stilts like a monster, like a four-legged Wow, monster. while you're on ice cream. While I'm on ice cream. In the middle. Oh God, you're brave. In the middle of the subway, and they had a unwrapped Pringles can that said help me on it in black Sharpie, and they smelled like shit, and I'm standing there thinking, if this isn't Eric Andre, I'm in grave danger. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm telling you, I waited about five years for the next season of the Eric Andre show, just so I could know whether that was you or not. That because was not me, but man, I am envious of whoever that was. Yeah, that's cool. That's like a character from Mulholland Drive or some like David Lynch kind yes. of thing. No, so I cannot claim that person's work, but uh, tip of the hat to a fellow uh, subway deviant.